I'd like to thank um, every, uh, everybody, for, and especially Sangeeta, for inviting me to India. Um, it's my first time here, and I'm very uh, more than glad uh, to be here and to discover your country and uh, your living uh, tradition. So um, my talk, uh, as you said, uh, Philip, is entitled, What About a First-Person Phenomenology? Um, for most phenomenological philosophers, such a question will appear pointless in virtue of its obviousness. What would be a phenomenological approach that would not be a first-person one? Phenomenology is a first, in the first person or is not. So the obvious argumentation of the philosopher is the following. As soon as the transcendental I is mentioned, we have to do with the first person proper. Since Husserl's phenomenology is exemplarily the science of a unique object, that is the subject, as the core of emergent lived experiences, which are described, phenomenology is ipso facto, facto first person investigation. So I would like here to question such a view, such a common view. And in order to do so, I will put into question the equivalence between the transcendental I and a first-person experiential instance. Um, I will refuse, for example, uh, Emile Benveniste's linguistic assertion according to which, excuse my, the French, qui dit je et je, the one who says I is an I, and I will claim as a counterpart the necessity of a radical first-person experience, who was, which was first contended by uh, the French psychologist Pierre Vermersch. And in doing so, I will show that the way to equate phenomenology and a radically first-person approach is first to demonstrate to what extent and how Husserl's phenomenology is mostly a third-person phenomenology. So in order to contend such a view, I will examine a few accounts drawn from uh, Ideas 1, from Husserl, from the lectures about passive synthesis, also from Husserl, and from Sartre's um, The Transcendence of the Ego. Um, I will try to sort out the ambivalence of the phenomenological Husserlian and Sartrean here uh, posture uh, as I posture, and the thrusts and the limitations of their uh, um, advances. And uh, in doing so, I, thought, I think I will be able to suggest a few experiential criteria of a first-person phenomenology. So my, my contention will be to explore the lived experience of the philosopher phenomenologist while I am writing and reading in order to experientially check my lived disposition. Um, in order to do so, I will have a few inspiring friends on the way. So Pierre Vermersch, uh, in uh, his book, founding book, L'Entretien d'Explicitation, Claire Petit-Mangin, in his uh, uh, new um, appeared book, Ten Years of Viewing from Within, and F. Berger, uh, in his book, Somato Psychopédagogie. Um, so um, my, my idea is to try to show how the phenomenologist is related, to what extent is the phenomenologist related to, his, uh, to the concepts, arguments, descriptions, examples, to what extent am I uh, embodily related to what I'm writing and reading. So um, I, I will uh, unfold for you here uh, first steps of a first-person phenomenological approach, which I call experiential reading and writing. And um, um, I, I had the well, hope to be able to share with you uh, some uh, discussion about that. So my, the steps I will, made here, I will make here today uh, are the following. To what extent is the transcendental eye a third-person phenomenological concept? Second, uh, the experiential criteria of a first-person phenomenology. And it, in, it includes also um, um, a way of parting from an exclusive focus on the I. And third, a first-person phenomenology requires an experiential praxis. So first, 
Um, I need, in order to, um, um, to show how uh, the transcendental I and phenomenological philosophy, the third person, and I, to, I, I need to um, bring about three components of a third person concept applied to the I. Uh, first, a metaphysical component, um, which means that the subject is necessary and universal, that is generic and hence objectified, and that's based on a, a, a metaphysical stance uh, c coming from uh, transcendental idealism, Kantian uh, exemplarily. Um, second, an epistemological component. Uh, the ego is an, what Husserl calls an eidos ego. It's a, it means an, an essence, essence ego, essential ego that is uh, inspired from mathematics in Husserl, an ideal invariant structure. And third, uh, there is a, also a grammatical component uh, um, in order to, um, uh, to claim this third person transcendental uh, I. The I is a he or she that is a non-person and then equivalent to a man. Um, then a few examples of the variety of the settings of the I in Husserl and Sartre. So here are the few extracts I would like to uh, more precisely uh, focus on. So I chose only very uh, small passages in order to be able to be um, more precise. So uh, Husserl, Passive Synthesis, paragraph uh, uh, 33, and uh, Eidos 1, uh, um, 20, 27, and some um, um, very small uh, passages from uh, the transcendence of the ego. So that's the first um, uh, passage from uh, Husserl. Um, so I, I, oh, it's not very... Um, Easy to read, sorry. Um, but I, I put some different colors, uh, so you can read the, the passage. I put some different colors in order to um, make appear what um, um, belongs to uh, temporal markers. Uh, it's in blue. What belongs to um, um, special uh, markers, it's in uh, green. And uh, what belongs to the activity of the subject, that's in, um, in red. And uh, these are... For me, uh, uh, this corresponds to the experiential relief, I would say, or the experiential stresses, different stresses uh, in, uh, in this extract. Um, what I put in, uh, in, in, font, uh, in bold font um, um, are examples of um, the way Husserl is uh, um, uh, having a, a logical argumentation while taking an evening story. It means it's not a specified story, it's one among others and so it's generic, or at the end, um, it's obviously due to the pre-effective lawful regularities. So it's also a, pre a presupposition, something that is required, a condition. So it belongs to the logical way of argument, arg argumenting. So there are two different, I will come back to that, but just to show you uh, how the text is, um, what I take out of the text uh, and the, the, the functioning of the text, I would say. Uh, so another extract, um, again the same colors in order to uh, discriminate um, different uh, experiential aspects, spatial, temporal, just now for example in blue, um, the eye presence, my attention, my back, and also um, in bold font the I, I can, I can, which means that it's a possibility so it's, uh, Husserl is not actually doing that, but he just mentions one possibility among others. So it's, again, generic. It's not a specified situation. Um, and finally, one uh, extract from uh, The Transcendence of the Ego from Sartre. So, sorry, it's in French because it's a French philosopher. So, <laughs> um, so just, I, well, if you can go through it, you will find the same uh, different colors and bold font. Uh, so in bold font, you see quelqu'un, somebody, so it's um, a non-identified uh, person. It's just somebody among other people. Or uh, in bold font, uh, somebody is uh, uh, hearing oneself, hearing himself uh, talk. Um, uh, or at the end, there is the consciousness. So th there is no I involved here. And um, so it's a generic I, again, which is mentioned here. And uh, you also find this... Uh, um, as a contrast, the different uh, spatial, spatial, temporal, and, um, and also the, the presence of the eye 
in a more uh, specified way, uh, je te déteste, I'm hating, I hate you, or uh, if uh, my state is being transformed, or quand je cours, when I, when I am uh, running after a tramway. Um, so you have this, I, I put these same different um, markers. So what we, what, what, we, what, what we can say at the provisionary conclusion of this first step uh, is, in, is that in order not to make confusion between the first person I and the private speech of a particular individual, Husserl and Sartre, for example, here, the only garde-fou uh, is to universalize the I as a non-person, making of it a generic transcendental I. And um, that's uh, Stéphane Chauvier's criticism in his uh, article, Ce que je dis du sujet, uh, who insists on the um, misleading use of the first person as being um, a proof that we would have to, to, to do with a, um, an experiential eye. Um, so the consequence, uh, as I said, um, is, um, um, well, I, I can then have, um, um, I can justify the critical stance against Emile Benvenist while reformulating his uh, own uh, statement. Um, the, when you say I, it doesn't necessarily uh, nor always mean an I in an experiential way. Um, and so uh, in, the, in the different uh, extracts I, I just mentioned, we can find two uh, examples that show that the I is generic, or as I, in a more radical way, I would say an unembodied empty shell in that, mean, that sense. Uh, when Husserl says, for example, I can let my attention wander away from the writing table. So again, it's um, one I among many others. He's not uh, specifying a, a situation here he would have experienced himself. Uh, or when Sartre says, quand je cours après un tramway, uh, il n'y a pas de jeu. When I'm running after a tram, there is no I. Um, so here again, it's a, a generic statement, unembodied in that sense. So um, at the transition from one step to the other, to the second one, uh, I would um, now come to the, um, the other view um, um, that sometimes the I, Husserl and Sartre are mentioning, is not an empty shell but is uh, actually an experiential working eye. And I will, I will quote two other uh, passages in order to uh, indicate this other possibility, also in Husserl and Sartre. Uh, Husserl saying, for example, I did not invent the universal concept of the object. I just use it uh, as it is required in any statement of the pure logic. So he is actually um, talking as a philosopher. I did not do that. You know? And Sartre, uh, in another statement, uh, in French, sorry, I was immersed in my lecture. So he's uh, talking about his own experience of uh, reading. Um, and I'm going to uh, remember the different uh, circumstances of my reading, my attitude, the lines I was, I was reading. I will then uh, resuscitate, re, um, well, let emerge again, not only the, the external details, but a certain um, density of my non-reflected consciousness. So he's really uh, uh, talking about what he's uh, experiencing at the very moment. So we also have uh, moments in the text, in Husserl and Sartre here, that uh, show uh, the experientiality of the I uh, experience. So uh, the second step uh, then is to try to show uh, how it's possible to have experiential criteria of a first person phenomenology. But that includes also parting from an exclusive focus from the I, on the I, sorry. So I will have three different, three questions. Um, what is a first person I, uh, given what we said? What is a first person non I? And uh, is it possible to define the first person neither as I nor as non I, but beneath the division? Um, so what is a first person I? Uh, it's not a private particular I. Uh, it's not a pri my private person. It's not uh, an objective neutral third person I, but it's a genuine first person embodied and related I. So how, uh, what's, what does it mean? Um, we may have two, two criteria, one negative, to the other positive, to begin to understand what it means. Uh, first, um, 
uh, it's um, um, being a uh, first person I implies um, a mode of being a subject versus a mode of being a thing. So that's very common to phenomenological tradition. Uh, and it also relies on Kant's difference between ends and means, the person as final end and not as a means. So it, it, it has an ethical component, but it may remain too theoretical or too uh, structural, I would say. So it's um, a negative, I would say, a negative criteria. And the second criteria, which is more uh, positive, uh, uh, relies on the embodied speech, the way I'm talking, the way I'm writing, the way I'm, I'm formulating things as an, is an embodied way within a specified situation and time. So it, it, uh, it involves an experiential individuation. And here I, I will uh, um, rely on Pierre Vermeer's work in psychology to combine, I mean, both uh, criteria. Um, so now what is, on the contrary, a first person non-I. Um, why why uh, should, will, will I put this question? Um, just because uh, we have um, very strong philosophical arguments against the exclusiveness of the I. You all, you all, you all know, of course, uh, solipsism, reflexivity, truth as a lived evidence. And so, um, uh, and we have many uh, uh, opportunities and possibilities to, um, to understand what uh, first person experience as an eyeless, I would say, eyeless first person experience could be. Uh, for example, the practice of decentering, um, <clears throat> decentering oneself, uh, for example, in the letting go uh, practice in Buddhism in, in Tonglen, um, as we mentioned uh, in this joint book on becoming aware, with, uh, uh, which I wrote uh, with uh, Francisco Varela and Pierre Vermeer, or, for example, as another example, in Merleau-Ponty or in, or in F. Berger, uh, Psychosomatopédagogie, the bodily, the inner movement, bodily relational reference. Or another example, um, which is um, mostly um, <coughs> dealt with by Petit Mangin, Claire Petit Mangin, the process of emergence of thoughts in me without me. So we have, well, here are some examples of what could be um, a first person experience which would uh, not have to uh, use the hypothesis of the I, I would say. As Newton said, I don't have, I don't need, uh, speaking of God, I don't need the, such a hypothesis. So here, maybe, I mean, we don't always need the hypothesis of the I to go for a first person experience. Maybe we'll find something like intersubjectivity. Um, why? Um, <clears throat> Because if, if, we, if we don't choose between uh, I and non-I to, to define the first person, uh, then we, uh, we choose not to separate. Uh, we choose not to uh, distinguish, but we choose to integrate or to relate. And <clears throat> if we choose to relate or to integrate, then we choose to, um, to go into something that um, is going to give the primacy to uh, the re relationship between uh, subjects, so to enter subjectivity. So we, uh, in the same way, we choose not to um, um, <clears throat> insist on the private, which always separates, it is separated from public, uh, but we go to the intimate, which is uh, the meaning of relation, connectedness, contact, embodiment, so I will make this dis distinction between private and intimate in that sense. And uh, we uh, come to this then to the relational level, um, not from a second person, which would be opposed as a you to an I. So again, we would be on a separative way, on an oppositional way, uh, but to the second persons as relational integrated dynamics of plural links. links. So uh, it's, it's a way to... Uh, um, not to uh, negate the, the I, but to, um, not, to, uh, not to be exclusive uh, of the, well, not to stick to the exclusiveness of the I, I would say. So now a third step. Um, first person phenomenological uh, approach then requires an experiential praxis. And here the challenge is to join two practices. Um, the explicitation interview um, inaugurated by Pierre Vermeer and then uh, followed up by Claire petit Mangin on the one side, and what I call experiential reading and writing. Why uh, is it necessary, uh, according to me, to, uh, to join these two um, practices and approaches? 
Um, why both? Um, so uh, the hypothesis is to, um, um, to mutually generate uh, these two approaches. Uh, and because if you use only an experiential introspection, as uh, Vermersch and Petit Mangin uh, do, uh, you stick to an empirical method with inductive generalization. Uh, and on the, other, on, the, on the other hand, sorry, if you only rely on philosophical phenomenology, you only get a priori concepts and you never reach a specified experience. So both are one-sided. And uh, um, to my view, it is needed to cross this both, both approaches in order to really get the core of uh, what an I person uh, phenomenology can be. So the, uh, just to, to recall uh, quickly what the explicitation interview consists in, uh, you have um, as preliminaries uh, four steps. Then it's, it goes deeper, of course, but that's just a preliminary uh, step, preliminary step, sorry. Uh, first, you have to choose a specified individuated situation. And for example, then it will be, it, will not, it won't be, uh, if I meet such a person in the street, which is a conditional thing, but yesterday I met Maxim, the technician of the audio audiovisual service at the university. So it's a specified situation. Uh, and that's the root of uh, which is needed in order to, to come to an experiential level. Then second step, you need to evoke in the technical meaning of relive uh, and bodily relate uh, to such a situation with as many details as possible. It was late, I was in a hurry, he was quite welcoming and efficient, and so on. Uh, third, you have to describe this experience while coming back to it as many times as necessary. So ye reiterate descriptions which enrich and detail the temporal sequences, um, at least in three phases, which is the minimal in order to unfold the experience, not to have a kind of compact um, a point. And fourth, you need to reconstruct the temporality of the experience because, of course, if you reiterate the descriptions, you will have the temporality of the explicitation, but not the temporality of the real experience. So you have to reconstruct the real time in order then to be able to analyze what has been described. So that's just preliminaries, but uh, it's very necessi necessary to follow these different steps. Um, transition from uh, this uh, method to what I'm trying to do as a philosopher, um, I would like to, uh, n to, um, um, to evoke three ways of dealing with the relation between empiricity and philosophy. In Pierre Vermeer's view, uh, there is a dissociation between a uh, first-person per first experiencing, which I uh, recalled in these four steps, and what he advocates as a third-person analy analyzing. So when it comes to anal analysis, uh, he uh, used his uh, uh, hat as um, a third-person scientist, while when he's experiencing, he used the, his hat as a phenomenologist, a first-person phenomenologist. So for me, it's, um, uh, this founding work is, um, um, has a, an epistemological contradiction, I would say. It's not coherent if you, when you analyze, you, 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 you stop embody, embodying your uh, own analysis and you, uh, you become neutral. Um, in Claire petit view, uh, there is a refusal, a, re a refusal of any third-person philosophical approach. Uh, and the, uh, he, she sticks to a first-person experiential inductive leading to uh, generic, sorry, to de generic structures. So there is an experiential coherence. She keeps this embodiment uh, all the way round, experiential all the way, but, it's okay, yeah. But there is a philosophical deficiency, to my view. So the challenge with uh, what I suggest as experiential reading and writing is to use the experiential explicitation techniques of embodily relating to oneself while, while dealing with text and concepts. That is, to produce an experiential, an experiential analysis. And the goal uh, is to observe um, my way of relating to myself, reading and writing as a philosopher and researcher. Uh, do I, and if yes, how do I see what I read and I, what, what I write. What is my mode of experientially being in touch with concepts and argumentation? 
So experiential reading um, means that you have to have a double reading. First, a conceptual, where you will uh, isolate what belongs to topical concepts, arguments, um, um, theory, etc., and an experiential reading. Uh, so it's uh, in the text I mentioned, I showed with these different colors how you can separate uh, experiential level and conceptual level or logical reasoning. And second, um, you can let emerge an embodied understanding, which is usually implicit uh, in the way you read by finding out in yourself a personal situation which corresponds in structure with the conceptual features of the situation of the text, but which will be endowed with your own personal content. And then experiential writing, which is the counterpart of experiential reading, um, means to describe my, my personal experience. And for example, if I come back to uh, Husserl's passive synthesis extract, where he was describing the stroll on the Loreto uh, Valley, um, I could have, in, as a structural parallel, I could have a disc my, my personal experience of the lights gradually emerging from the night on the opposite coast of the Lemon Lake in Switzerland, where I have a family house. And um, I, I made such a description uh, in a more accurate way along the four steps I mentioned through explicitation uh, interview. And then the second step would be to cross compare uh, the third person description, philosophical, Husserl's description, and my first personal experiential one. And while doing this uh, comparison, you will have common features appearing. For example, in both cases, you have to do with a store, and it's a visual kinesthetic perception activity uh, which emerge, emerges. And you have a kind of dynamics between affection and attention because you're being affected by the lights and you uh, turning your attention to uh, everything that emerges. So in both cases, you have these structural features. But you also have contrasted, contrasted features. For example, the temporality of affection. It's, uh, it's described by Husserl as being sudden, as a flash, it's immediate, it's in one stroke, if you recall the passages. Whereas uh, my own experience um, um, describe this uh, emergence as something gradual, as a, a kind of constancy. So you don't find the same features in both. And second, a second contrasted feature I could uh, let emerge was the emotionality of the situation. Uh, in my own experience, um, this emergence of lights was um, overwhelmed by the sense of beauty and archaic feeling of nostalgia um, coming from my infancy. Whereas in Husserl, you don't have any emotional component in this particular extract. Uh, affection uh, being quite different from emotion in Husserl because affection means only being affected by uh, an event or a situation or an object. So it's perceptive in a sense, it's not emotional. So you have common features and contrasted features. So as a provisionary conclusion, what could I say? Um, maybe um, putting two questions. Uh, what is the benefit of a first person experimenting? Looking uh, from within, uh, looking within, but um, I, uh, it's a hint at the view from within uh, from uh, uh, this uh, volume from Francisco and, uh, and uh, uh, Jonathan uh, Shear. Uh, looking from within enables to embody your understanding of a phenomenological text so as to become aware of your experiential personal roots uh, in your process of understanding. So developing an embodied understanding. It makes your understanding yours more solid, more genuine. And uh, on the other side, what is the benefit of confronting a third person philosophical text? Uh, again, looking within or looking from within as such a conceptual architecture um, is like entering the fabrication process of a metal. You see better your own limitations and where you are uh, also, it undoes some um, uh, illusions you may have about yourself, about where you are in your knowledge. So, just very quickly, um, just to uh, have a hint uh, at Husserl's um, paragraph in Ideas 1, where he develops some features of an ethics of a first-person phenomenology. Faithfulness to the given and its expression, provisional, provisional fragility of a description, it's never absolute, it's always very precarious. Confidence in what is obtained. 
a gradual progression through exercising, so it's a trained experience, it's not a standard, ordinary it's a trained experience, and also inner freedom through attentional uh, vigilance. And thanks uh, to, every, for, to everybody for your attention, and also special thanks to my students at the University of Rouen, with whom I'm uh, experimenting such an embodied way of reading and writing, and doctoral students and master students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dukna. We invite uh, comments and questions. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of phenomenological reflection, also a very original uh, proposal, very intriguing from the context. Our task is to relate it to the topics of the previous two days and to today's topic. So feel free to ask questions that probe and expand the implications of Natalie's work for other themes of Hi. My name is Suresh Joyce. Uh, I'm an IT consultant, but I also teach a course in neuroinformatics right now. Uh, my question is, uh, um, in analyzing it, the, the last three slides that you showed about experiential reading and writing, I saw a lot of parallel between your methodology and that of uh, uh, method acting uh, propounded by Stanislavski. Oh, do, you, <laughs> do you feel there is a correspondence? Mm -hmm. um, so that's question number one. Question number two is, mm -hmm. Um, analyzing a given text for whether it is uh, it constitutes experiential reading or writing, uh, is, does it mostly occur at the level of syntax, semantics, or semiotics, or a combination of all the three? What kind of analysis uh, will, would yield uh, mm -hmm. insights into a text? Yeah, thank, th you. thank you very much for your, your questions. Um, uh, the, the correspondence with Stanislavski is, um, is interesting, and I Actually, I have a doctoral student who is working on the phenomenology of the actor. And she's herself a comedian, uh, an actress, and uh, she, uh, she was built in philosophy. So, so she really tries to, uh, to have an embodied uh, way of uh, looking at Husserl's text, passive synthesis and imagination texts, in order to understand what's going on in the, how do you say, personage, in the, the I mean, in the, in, the the, yeah, exactly, the character. Uh, how, 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 what link, what, 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 um, what kind of link there is between the character and the, the actor? So, uh, and she, she was built with uh, Stanislavski uh, methods. So, I think it's quite, quite true. It's interesting. And uh, the second question, uh, as far as linguistics is concerned, um, I just um, I appeal to Bavinist. Um, because he has a very broad understanding of lingu linguistic and also a very interesting way to relate to phenomenology, even if I, I criticize him. Uh, I, I think he has a very uh, great understanding of subjectivity within uh, the language. Uh, and he, he interplays first, second, and three persons. As you know, it's very uh, well known. And um, I would say that um, my, my own uh, investigation through text, through texts is to... Um, uh, uh, consists in uh, being uh, attentive to uh, syntax uh, because it, uh, it gives um, an, an idea of what's going on as far as uh, the logical uh, reasoning is concerned. Um, but, um, but I rely on the very, I'm very much, I'm very careful about the examples the philosophers are using um, because in this, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the examples you, would, you, you will find the core, uh, the more semantical core and, uh, and, uh, and then you will fa find here the, the more embodied uh, reliance uh, of the f philosophers to what, they, what they're saying. So I, I would say both semantics and, uh, and syntax are very important, and you have to join both, I would say. Uh, Natalie, I'd like to congratulate you on the wonderful construction that you've produced out of all these modern philosophers. Um, I'd like to offer you a thought on how to unify your talk with the talk that preceded it. Mm -hmm. Within the structure of pure consciousness, there is a fundamental concept which can be expressed in a very simple way. The nature of pure consciousness is that the knower knows himself. It's said very clearly in the Gita, mm -hmm. the self knows itself through itself by itself. In this process, the knower, the process of knowing, and the known have become one. That is to say that there is a singular structure, 
And that singular structure is expressed in the literature of yoga in a word which is often translated another way, but which real Sanskrit scholars confirm for me should really be translated ideally as singularity. Okay, I'm going to ask... ask that to singularity the is kaivalya. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I offer you that thought that there are two aspects of pure consciousness, a singularity in which knower process of knowing and known are one, and there is the knower knowing himself. Thank you very much. And I would offer that to you as a thought. Mm -hmm. that this is a reflection of what you've said. Yeah, I can maybe add another reflection to your reflection. And just to, uh, to say that uh, it's uh, for me quite interesting. I don't, I, well, I don't know very well this text, the Gita, even if I read it, but um, well, it's not, I, I, I did not um, look uh, within <laughs> very uh, uh, accurately. So what you say is interesting for me because it, uh, it uh, echoes for me uh, Husserl's uh, intentional correlation. Uh, you know, Noema, Noesis, and the subject being uh, uh, inter interplaying. Uh, so there is a threefold uh, component uh, structure in uh, intentionality. So it might, maybe it uh, could be interesting to compare both. Thank you very much. Thanks. And the final question, please. So I want to con comment on this from the point of view of the aesthetic experience where the writer, the reader, and also the experiencer himself comes. There is a saying that nayakasya kavehe srotuhu samano anubhavaha skutaha. That is the hero or the person, the character, and his experience. And also the experience of the poet when he identifies himself and produces the poem or something, the linguistic form. And then the reader who uh, re-experiences the thing, the experience of the uh, character as conveyed to him by the poem, by the poet. And these three are identical. There is a kind of, when you analyze the reader's position and also the uh, writer's position and also the uh, I mean, uh, character and also the medium that is, it may be art, any art, as a matter of fact, any communication system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, reading and writing, you take language. But uh, all other art forms are also as uh, suggestive as language is. And all language is suggestive according to Bhartrari. So much so, what I would try to make out is that this analysis of the experience of the characters, the a poet and also the reader, and they should be analyzed. And I think it may be related to you, but I am uh, uh, commenting from the viewpoint of the Sanskrit aesthetics, but mm -hmm. I, the, the actually Kashmirian aesthetics. Uh -huh. I Thank think it may be of use. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, maybe it could be interesting to relate that to uh, what we have in uh, in the West uh, with the constant the Constance School. Uh, re um, reception aesthetics, where the reader is, uh, for example, Wolfgang Iser uh, books, The Act of Reading um, in the 60s, where uh, he insists on the, the fundamental role of the reader as being a, a, um, a productive instance of the creation of the work. So the reader is not only an after effect, but is really an intrinsic, intrinsic component of the work as uh, being created. So maybe there, there could be interesting views to, to draw, to draw for that, from that. And I was much inspired by Wolfgang Iser's work as well. So thank you for your comment. Thank you. Please join me in thanking yes. Professor Nathalie.